So you might be thinking all is well and good, right? Wrong. This tank and all of my tanks are totally infected with the most nuisance thing on the face of the earth. Welcome back guys, today we are checking out the Avatar tank once again. You might remember from the last video that we basically took out a ton of algae that was in this aquarium. I'm trying to distance myself from being world famous for having horrendous algae problems and I think we're making good progress on that. That video came out a month ago but it's all footage that was from even longer before then. So I want to say we're about two months since all of that took place and if you remember we used some of the Fritz algae clean out to kill off some of that crazy string slime hybrid algae that was in this aquarium and so far it's doing pretty good. Again, two months and we don't have it back at least. Just yesterday I came in and tried to tidy things up a little bit. We're going to talk all about this aquarium, but as you probably noticed, there's a little bit of uh, trimmings and plant leaves from a plant I want to show you in a second. Uh, let's do a little bit of work on this. The last time you saw this tank, it was obviously way worse than it is now. We went through and we kind of identified maybe what the issues were, and then we were gonna tweak those things that we identified to see if that would help the problem. So, uh, again, we used a little bit of a Band-Aid, we used the Fritz Cleanout stuff, which can tackle a lot of different types of algae. It's not gonna work on absolutely everything, but it can help you if you have something that's just totally out of control. So we did that, and then we also turned the light weight down because what we observed was the rotala in the front of the aquarium was staying really low. It wasn't growing up like it was searching towards the light, so I then thought that, hey, we probably have way too much light going into this aquarium. A couple other things were going on, but that's what we did. So we turned the lighting way down, we moved it more towards the front of the aquarium, and the results here two months later, about two months, I think we see the desired effect. So we have obviously much less algae, haven't had to add anything to the tank since then, and the rotala we removed some in the front, um, but the stuff that is closer to under the light source is starting to grow up taller. And I actually kind of like that it's here. I was debating whether or not I should remove all of it, but I think this is pretty much what I wanted to achieve. So you might be thinking all is well and good, right? Wrong. This tank and all of my tanks are totally infected with the most nuisance thing on the face of the earth. And I mean, I need to redo all three of these tanks anyway. It's been way too long. We need some new scapes but this is pretty much the main reason why I've lost motivation and eventually going to do that here pretty soon. Some of you probably have noticed that we have some bladder wart in this tank. And in this tank, somewhere, it likes to hide in the Rotala. And we even, I think we do have a little bit in here. It's pretty much impossible to see anything in this tank because the Monte Carlo is just what it is. But I mean, without showing too much of my super messy room, it's even crept over into other tanks. I pretty much get how it travels from tank to tank, but at the same time, I just don't want to believe how it does it. Like, what is it, airborne or something? I, I'm, it's crazy, it's crazy. I've done as much as I can to mitigate it, uh, but there isn't really thing, at least I know or can find on Google, how to selectively get rid of bladder wart. It's kind of a, you have to just, totally tear down your tank and try not to spread it to the next one that you set up. Removal of this stuff is not just really difficult in moss, it's difficult to remove uh, in anything, okay, because it anchors itself. We're going to get a closer look at it here. It's just kind of this little stringy plant with these nodes on the end and it's super fragile. So you go in, you think you have like a full strand of it, you pull it, and then it breaks and who knows where it originates. Obviously the moss is like an extreme case, but even if we look around the kind of busted up sand waterfall tank, like there's a piece of it right there. Was that all of it? Probably not. When I trim the Rotala, I'll notice like a big clump of it just hanging on back here. After, of course, I previously thought that I had gotten rid of all of it, so I don't know, it just keeps coming back. And I'm really careful when I go from tank to tank. I don't just have my hands in one, pull them out, and go into another one. I always inspect and make sure, you know, if I'm in a tank, especially that has like duckweed, 
I'm not transferring duckweed over. So I'm not saying that that's never happened with the bladder wart. I'm sure it inevitably has, but this is just something that is pretty much impossible for me to deal with and get rid of completely at this point. If you know how to get rid of bladder wart, please tell me, help me out here. I almost forgot to show you guys the plant that we wanted to look at in this aquarium. And that is the, I think this is the trident leaf java fern. It's not needle leaf, it might be needle leaf. I actually, I can't remember, but this is the way that it's supposed to look, I know, uh, when it's really happy and it's growing out laterally like this. That makes me really happy. I've never gotten it to, to do this. Again, if it's the trident, then I think that's what it's supposed to do. If that's the trident, I can't really remember. I'm all over the place, guys, but all in all, I think the aquarium looks pretty good, um, minus the fact that we have all this crappy bladder wart in here. So yeah, that's kind of where we're at, guys. Uh, on top of that, you know, I don't really know exactly what I want to do with these tanks. Some of the plants, like, you know, with the moss in here, I can't reuse any of this because I risk bringing that bladder wart into the new tank. So that kind of sucks. Maybe I can go through and trim a little bit and be sure that there's nothing in there and then grow it out for a while, but it's probably gonna have to be a total teardown and a redo. You might be wondering where does bladder wart come from? How did it get introduced in here? And it's basically just, it comes in on some plants that you get. So hopefully that's something that never happens to you. This is actually the first time that I've ever had it ever in my fish keeping career. So I don't think it's something to be worried about, but just, you know, if you're getting new plants from especially like a new source, inspect them out, make sure you don't see any little thing. I think it's one of those things where you just get unlucky and if you don't do something about it right away, then it can become a problem like it has for me. So just keep that in mind, guys. It's just another one of those joys of fish keeping, I guess plant keeping, but you, you know what I mean. Today is also a super nice day, so I thought we'd come out and we'd check out the overwinterized patio pond. Looks like we have some friends hanging out with us here. There's one deer and then there's another one over there. Probably can't see it because this camera kind of sucks. But anyway, the patio pond from last year, obviously it's gone through its winterization. Um, I have to come in and cut this plant down, which I did a little late in the season a few months ago, but we can already start to see some new leaves poking up. And then this plant, whatever it is, I can't really remember. This one stays green even throughout the winter time. I know it's kind of hard to see because it's the time of the day where the shade takes over. So we can't really get a very good look inside this pond, but it is totally crazy. So we're gonna have to get in here, scoop out all of this decaying plant material, detritus, mulm, whatever you want to call it, and kind of start fresh. So we're gonna do that here pretty soon. Just wanted to get some little B-roll that I can use for a future video showing kind of what happens to it over the winter time. Today would also be a really good day to actually go check out the greenhouse. I wasn't gonna do it originally when I was walking downstairs, but I think we should probably go check it out. It's a little muddy out here. Oh. Get my door stopper out of the way. And here's the pond, guys, in the greenhouse. So I have the hose out already doing some water changes. I'll probably get in here and top this up. Won't bore you with that, but Chris is down there. He's still doing really good. I don't know how many golden white clouds we still have in here or cherry barbs for that matter. The cherries are really hard to see because they're pretty, you know, they're that really dark color red. So there's a golden. I saw, I don't know if you guys saw that, but there's at least one there. Uh, hopefully there's some more. Who knows if they bred over the winter time. We kept it nice and toasty with a, probably a, I think it's a 300 watt heater in here. So that keeps the greenhouse, even in the dead of winter when it's really cold outside, keeps it in, you know, the, the mid 60s, maybe, maybe low 70s. I can't really remember to be honest with you. I just did exactly what I did the previous year and everything was all good. We definitely need to go through here and remove some plants, maybe change some things up. This thing, whatever this is, got huge, ginormous. Um, there's some dead palms over here. Probably take this guy out. He didn't really make it. Um, just clean things up. Yeah, look at how big that thing is. And hopefully we can make this pretty cool again this summer. Luckily, one of our tanks, guys, doesn't have any of the bladder wart. So 
the floating aquascape tank that we set up most recently is not looking super great. We trimmed a little bit of it and didn't finish doing our work, but this tank is all free of that. Um, it has a little bit of algae stuff going on. We had our CO2 run out, and so we this thing is overdue for some work. Let's let's actually let's trim this thing up and let's see if we can make it a little bit more complete. It's not perfect, but this is only about 15 minutes after I just did a big old water change and obviously a lot of work in this tank, guys. So something that I haven't done quite yet is clean off the fishing line that holds this apparatus of wood afloat. But the fish seem happy and their home is now looking a little bit better. So obviously hacked a bunch of the rotala back. You always have to cut it lower than you think because that's where all the new growths are going to start. Still probably need to hack it down a little bit more if we really want to get the look that, that I want. This tank didn't turn out exactly how I thought it would. A lot of the moss down here on some of the shadier areas didn't really take all too well, which is... Interesting because usually moss can do pretty good in a low light environment, but the stuff up here that gets more light has done a lot better except for this little piece in the back looking a little sparse. So we might have to do, you know, drain it down, do a little bit of new moss and super glue and see how it does. Of course, we use the fishing line technique on this setup and it's worked okay. A lot of my Anubias could use a little bit of a refresh. We have some pockets in here where we could put some more plants. So I'm probably gonna work on sourcing some of that or I might just go with good old Java Fern. Well, you'll have to stay tuned to see what we end up doing, but so far this tank has, has done what I thought it would do, which is kind of just mediocre growth, and it's hanging in there. Our CO2 ran out as well over here, so that's another issue that we have to take care of, and I promise I'll do it tomorrow, guys. I promise. This is the corner of the fish room that I try really hard not to show you guys for obvious reasons. This, this needs to change. We need a lot more functional space and you'll see why. But if I go ahead and swing around here, we should probably talk about this. So I started a fish food brand. Why is it called Legit? We're gonna get to that in just a second. But I wanna premise this with the, the kind of the whole story about it so it'll make a little bit more sense. In 2018, I think it was, maybe towards the end of that year, um, I met the person that owns the manufacturing company, Piscine Energetics. I got hooked up with him, we started talking, and it became more and more real that I could have a fish food brand and they would make the food. Now, I could have gone to any number of fish food manufacturers with this idea to start a brand. I could have just slapped, you know, whatever on there, could have put legit on it, but that would have been a lie because it wouldn't have been legit. What I learned in the early days of building legit fish food was that not all fish food is made the same, but it kind of is, and it's, it's all really bad. So if we start talking about the pet food industry, which includes fish food, pet food is made with the cheapest, most throwaway ingredients that are basically at the end of the process. Everything good has been taken off of them. It's the scraps that are left over and then they mash that all together, they heat it up super hot and they make a pet food. It doesn't really matter what it is, if you're talking about dog kibble or you're talking about fish pellets, it's all kind of the same. Different ingredients of course, but it's all pretty much the same concept. It's all more or less made in the same bad way. There is an exception to this and it's the way that Piscine Energetics makes their food. So. Over the last couple of years, I've learned so much about the pet food industry, fish food, fish health, all of that stuff. And it became really obvious that this was going to be a legit food. And that's why I decided to call it legit fish food. But now let's kind of talk about why specifically it's legit. Remember how I said that the pet food industry uses the cheapest throwaway ingredients possible and then heats it up super hot? Pysine does it a little different. 
So they take their raw ingredients, which are more expensive than most, instead of using fish meal, just leftover fish carcass with whatever's on it, they use a deboned fish meal. So they get the, the skeleton out of the fish. That's important for the ash content. And then this whole thing can get really complicated and I'm probably not gonna do the best job of explaining it in a perfect way because that's just how I am, but bear with me. They spend the extra money and they get the ingredients that aren't gonna contribute to a bad food. The other thing that they do is they don't heat the food up super hot. They do what's called a cold extrusion instead of a normal super hot extrusion. What temperature does to the ingredients of your food is it denatures it, okay? Instead of getting out a nice pretty amino acid that your fish can use, it comes out like this. It comes up twisted, it breaks apart, and then the fish is left with something that it can't use as efficiently. It has to use more energy to either repair this or strip off of what it needs, and then you're left with a fish that feels like it just ate a huge meal of fast food. The easiest way to describe this is that all their fish foods, pellets and flakes specifically, are like fast food. You know that feeling when you eat a bunch of Big Macs, McDonald's don't sue me, uh, you feel bloated, you gotta go lay down, you're like, oh man, I need to take, you know, an hour here to digest this. Instead of that, you're eating like a nice piece of salmon and a salad, something that you know is good, and then you feel a whole lot better. You feel light and you have energy. That is what legit fish food is like. Because legit fish food doesn't reach temperatures of 100 degrees centigrade and higher during the process in which it's made, that means that your amino acids are intact and your fish can use this as efficiently as possible. So, uh, we talk a lot about the molecular integrity of the food, the way it's made. I know you're probably wondering why aren't all other fish foods made this way? It's because of time, it's because of money, and it's because, let's face it, the pet industry is just like uh, any other industry. They wanna maximize profits, so they're gonna do that in the, you know, the most obvious ways they can. Legit fish food is not doing that. We are focused on the hobbyist, the fish keeper, the people that love their fish and wanna feed them the best food. That's it. What's in the food? Let's talk about it. So the two main ingredients, it's about 50-50. We've deboned whitefish, and then we have P.E. mysis. The reason why the P.E. mysis is so cool is that it's a freshwater shrimp, but it's an invasive species. So what Piscean Energetics does is they have the exclusive rights to go in and harvest this shrimp, and then they flash freeze it, or they don't flash freeze it depending on what time of year it is. They take it off the boat, and then they turn it into food. So there's no packing up, putting it on ice, shipping it, places where things can happen. You get it right from the lake, right to the place where they make it, and then you get a pellet that is specially made to order by me. So the food is really, really fresh. So not only are we removing an invasive species that can cause problems for the native salmon population, um, you're also getting a super high quality food as well. There's also a bunch of other ingredients in there that are added to the food to make sure that it is a complete nutritional source for your fish. And so the results are your fish are gonna be happier, healthier, they're gonna have more energy to swim around because they're not gonna be digesting a bunch of fast food all day. Even though you probably haven't heard of Piscean Energetics before, they've been in the aquarium industry and making food for a long time. They're more known on the saltwater side of things where their frozen PE mysis is really popular. And actually another big part of PE's business is selling their frozen mysis shrimp and their pellets to public aquariums and fish farms. So for example, if the, you know, whatever public aquarium is trying to raise up some sturgeon, they'll sprinkle in some of their pellets because they know that they're more apt to take to that food than any other kind of solid food. And fish farms, they need their fish to be healthy, so they choose to feed this stuff. Now PE also has a pellet on the market, but what's different about legit fish food is two things. One, it's a slightly different formula, but then two, the sizing. The sizing was super important to me, and what they had for themselves on the market, I didn't think was gonna be very applicable to the freshwater hobby. So the nano food, which is right here, we'll take a look at these bins here in a little bit, um, is a super, super tiny pellet. 
and it's mixed in. It has almost like a little bit of powder as well, but not quite powder, if that makes sense. You'll have to see it for yourself, but this is gonna primarily stay at the top of the aquarium, and I even feed it to small fry. Over here behind you is the community food. So this is a mixed pellet, bigger than the Nano, but it's gonna have pieces when you sprinkle it in, some is gonna fall right away, the bigger stuff, and then that's gonna allow you to separate your feeding. So if you have, like, in my big tank, angelfish, I just take a pinch of this, I don't have to grind it up in my fingers or anything, no more of that. So that is the two ounce of this. We also have four ounce bags of all three of our foods. But that leaves us with one more, which is the bottom feeder. So this is like a really big pellet, and it's oblong shape, so you're gonna take this, you're gonna sprinkle it in your tank, they're gonna fall right away, and Cory cats love this stuff, loaches, um, I mean, people ask me, you know, is this a good food for shrimp? I feed it to shrimp every once in a while. It's not specifically tailored towards them. It doesn't have extra vegetable matter in it, so it's not quite the perfect food for, say, a shrimp, but they'll certainly eat this stuff. So another reason why it's legit is because instead of just making this all about me, I wanted to figure out a way to give back. If this company ends up being really successful, how can I give back to the hobby, right? Because this is something that I want to be a part of for my whole life. So I thought, okay, well, we'll do a donation on percentage of sales or something like that, but who would we give the money to? Um, there was only one nonprofit that came to my mind that's really integrated into the aquarium keeping hobby, and that was Project Piaba. So for the rest of 2022, and who knows, maybe it's for forever, for the lifetime of this company, the goal is to give 5% of the net profits from sales on the website. With, of course, the goal to expand that to all the different ways that we sell the food. I just have to be really careful. I don't wanna overextend myself. I have to pour everything that I make from this company back into it to try and grow it out, of course. Um, and so that's the goal. That's another reason why it's legit. So yeah, guys, that is legit fish food in a nutshell. That's why it's legit. Uh, I'll give you a little tour of the company now. Ta-da! Impressive, right? Right next to the home gym. We got everything down here, man. So this is where, you know, I'm packing all the orders, stamping boxes with our legit stamp to make sure our packaging is as on point as possible. Over here is where I pack up free samples and, you know, we, of course, we, we throw in stickers in all the orders, guys, of course. We have some of the original test foods over here where you know we were spending the time getting the sizing right, so here's some what ended up being the community food in a nano bag, so I, I take this stuff, I repurpose it, don't want it to go to waste. I'm of course feeding this stuff, and I have been feeding this stuff in the fish room for probably the last two years. We got all the food in bins down here. We got our nano our community, our bottom feeder. So again, two sizes. We're working on making a smaller size that's a little less expensive for you because you know it is it is a premium food, so it does cost a little bit more. But what you have to remember is that because the food is so intact compared to other foods, you really don't need to feed as much of this compared to any other food that you've fed before. So I just tell people feed half as much as you normally do and if you think about it that way, then the food is actually one of the cheaper foods on the market because you don't have to feed as much. Unfortunately, there isn't a good way to distribute free samples to people, especially over YouTube like this. But what I will say is that if you guys head over to the sticker store and you purchase any sticker, it could just be one sticker, I will throw in a sample of legit fish food for you to try. I think right now I only have the community food bagged up, but if you, again, if you purchase on the sticker store, I will throw one in. I will eventually be working on some nano samples and some bottom feeder samples as well, so you can just put in the order comments which one of those three you'd want, and then I'll hook you guys up. You can try it for a little bit cheaper than it would be to like buy a bag. And since this video should come out on a weekend, guys, I think we will do these two holographic stickers for free if you purchase anything on the sticker store. And so that way you're gonna get these two holographic stickers, whatever stickers you get, and a free sample of legit and don't forget the five packs of stickers, it's uh, two random stickers in that. So you get four free stickers, two of which being holographic and a fish, legit fish food sample. Consider it. Think about it. Alright guys, that is 
it for the pitch. I know that was long if you watched this whole thing. Thank you very much. Uh, your time means a lot to me. And uh, yeah, I think this is, this is probably the only time that I will do this in depth of a pitch of legit fish food. So don't worry. I know that, you know, one of the biggest complaints is that uh, things get over corporatized or whatever the, the right word is. I'm not gonna be doing legit fish food promos in every video. You might see a bag and, and casually see me have it, um, but you know, we're not gonna be just shilling out corporate stuff, even if it's my own corporate stuff, if that makes sense. Anyway, thanks for watching guys. I appreciate it. Help me take on big fish food. Let's do this.